Think about this. In four weeks of air action against Serbian targets in Yugoslavia and Kosovo, the U.S. military has yet to suffer a single casualty. In a few hours of mindless violence today at a suburban high school outside Denver, two kids are believed to have killed and wounded about 50 of their classmates and then killed themselves. As we all begin to process what happened and begin to wonder why, consider this. According to one of the students from Columbine High School, who'll be joining us in a few minutes, the shooters may have belonged to a group that was known as the Trenchcoat Mafia. There were about eight or ten of them who wore black trench coats to school every day, no matter what the weather, and some of them used to draw swastikas on their body. It may or may not be relevant, but today, April 20th, would have been Adolf Hitler's 110th birthday. When you're trying to explain why high school students would blow away 25 or more of their classmates, wounding a similar number, one theory seems to be as good as the next. So what did happen today in Littleton, Colorado, this place that most of us had never heard of until today? Here's ABC correspondent Judy Muller. Shortly after 11.15 Mountain Time, the first signs of trouble. Outside Columbine High School, in the parking lot, There's students hear the sound shots, of gunfire. And we looked over and we saw some guys peeking around the corner with guns. And uh, we saw them shoot three people in the parking lot. And uh, we, they That's looked... when we knew it was real. Yeah. They saw the gunmen throw grenades or pipe bombs on top of the school roof. A number of witnesses recognized the two as members of a group called the Trench Coat Mafia. Yeah, they like wear trench coats every day to school, like and wear makeup and like, paint their nails and stuff. They're just like uh, I don't know. Everyone kind of thinks of them as different, and they always just hang out with themselves only, kind of associate themselves with like death and violence. They always wear black clothing or dark clothing, glasses, berets. They get. They get made fun Not of a lot. A lot, a lot of kids like them. Yeah. They get made fun of a lot. Yes. Yeah, by other students sometimes. 11.30, the fire alarm was sounded. School teacher Paula Reed hustled her students out. As I got outside the building, right, right outside the building, teachers and administrators were yelling to the kids, get them out of here, get them out of here, get them all the way to the park. At first, she said, there was no panic. Kids started to run out of the gymnasium saying there's people in there with guns. Um, but the general reaction from most of the people around me was, yeah, right, <laughs> because there are no guns to speak of at Columbine. At least that's our perception of things. But many students were trapped inside the building. For the this. next hour and a half, the two gunmen made their lives hell as they roamed the hallways, classrooms, and cafeteria, firing in every direction. I heard people pray for their husbands, their children, you, know you name it. Yeah, and uh, huh? at that well, point, these guys were killing just to kill. Senior Nick Foss witnessed the horror before he managed to escape. I've never seen so many dead people in my life, and some of my friends did. You know, I've never seen someone's face shot off in front of me. It's not cool, not pretty. I can't get out of my head. Some of the worst carnage was in the library. There was a guy at a table right next to, us, next to me and her, and they just shot him, and then walked away, and then... He was just sitting there in a pool of blood. We all got under the desk and, and then they just started coming in the library and opening fire and shooting out bomb bombs. By noon, police SWAT teams had surrounded the building. They pulled students out whenever and however they could. One student who'd been wounded was pulled through a second floor window. At a time when students would normally be finishing their lunch and returning to class, they were still fleeing, many taking refuge in nearby houses. The scene was chaos as paramedics tried to treat the wounded and parents tried to locate their children. Some of them were reunited at a nearby school. All the while, inside the Columbine High School, the shooting continued. At 12.15, the first of the wounded were taken to nearby hospitals. At approximately 1 p.m., nearly one and a half hours after the shooting began, the SWAT team entered. Dozens of students ran out with their hands in the air. Police were wary that the gunmen might try to escape by blending in with the crowd. As the afternoon wore on, the wait became excruciating for those parents who had still had no word of their children. Many of them gathered here at a local public library near the school where lists had been posted of names of children who had called in to let their parents know they were all right. For those who could not find the name on the list they were looking for, it was a very, very long day. Between 2 and 4 p.m., the scene in this neighborhood was one of extremes. Joy when families were reunited and despair when the minutes ticked by with no news. Every now and then, an official would read off an updated list of those found. 
Then, at 4.16 p.m., the sheriff held a news briefing to deliver the news everyone feared. Well, we've transported initially 14 to local area hospitals with gunshot wounds, and we've had, uh, what I understand, 25 additional victims uh, that were uh, deceased. 7 p.m., parents, students, teachers, and neighbors gather at the Light of the World Catholic Church, just a few blocks from the high school. And throughout this stunned community, people were repeating the same thing that too many other communities have said in recent years. I just keep thinking that this does not happen at our school and that I'm going to wake up and this is going to be over. Because, God, not at Columbine, you know? It happens in some other school somewhere else. It doesn't happen here. Now that it has happened here, the gruesome but all too familiar denouement begins. The search for a motivation, the calls for tighter gun control, the counseling sessions at school, and the endless, endless grief. In Denver, I'm Judy Muller for Nightline.